Nowhere on Earth is life so richly concentrated as in the ancient temperate rainforests of the Pacific Northwest. Along the fertile watersheds of Vancouver Island, an extraordinary ecosystem has been evolving for 10,000 years. The magnificent stands of Sitka spruce, hemlock, fir, and western red cedar contain some of the tallest and oldest trees on the planet. Beneath the canopy, the rainforest teems with life, thousands of species flourishing together in an intricate, ever-changing balance. The same lush fertility that makes these forests thrive also produces trees with unmatched value in the marketplace. After nearly 100 years of coastal logging, much of British Columbia's temperate rainforest has already encountered the formidable pressures of the economy. The forest industry has long been the economic backbone of British Columbia. With rising global demand for lumber and pulp and an ever-accelerating rate of cut, wilderness areas are disappearing rapidly. Of 89 primary watersheds on Vancouver Island, only six remain as virgin forests. Most of these are slated for harvesting. One of the few surviving areas of old growth is the Carmana Valley, a tiny watershed on the southwest coast of Vancouver Island. When Macmillan Bloedel Limited revealed plans to clear cut the entire area, public opposition was widespread and dramatic. Throughout the summer of 1989, more than 100 of Canada's most gifted artists trekked into the rainforest to stage an innovative protest. Organized by the Western Canada Wilderness Committee, the Carmana Art Project brought together visual artists from a wide variety of backgrounds to raise public awareness about the threat to the rainforest. From their base camp beside Carmana Creek, the artists ventured out to sketch, paint, photograph, and sculpt their impressions of the wilderness. The expeditions and the art they produced provided a fresh perspective on the heated debate over BC's old growth forests. It brought into focus an important element usually ignored in the controversy, our spiritual relationship with the world of nature. Although all the artists were united in their commitment to save the Karmana, their work is a study in contrasts. Each person interpreted the rainforest in his or her own distinctive way. Jack Shadbolt is one of Canada's most renowned artists. Throughout his 60-year career, he has been fascinated with the landscape of British Columbia. In his art and writing, he has worked hard to define a human relationship to the land. Standing with my back to this big tree that's behind here you know how can i help but feel something of the tremendous grandeur of natural growth that the world has a certain kind of meaning you know to quote, quote manly hopkins the world is charged with the grandeur of god you know or something of that comes into your mind these things that the poets have talked about for a long time and they still talk about. And I like to live somewhere near that kind of feeling as an antidote to all the practical things I have to do in life just to survive. There are two things in British Columbia that are very important. One is the Indian heritage, which we're 
sometimes doing our best to drive down the drain of history. And the other one is the natural heritage of the landscape itself. And these are great assets. They're the thing that make British Columbia a worthy and worthwhile image. It's a world image. And images are very important, I think. I don't think we should tamper with them too much. We need them. We live by symbols. And, and those are the things that form our images of nature, of the universe, of religious feelings about everything else. All of that is a very significant part of the process of living. And I think our deep rainforest belongs with the big symbols of the world. And to let that go, my God, is such a piece of absurdity. Anything which nourishes the spirit is worth preserving. Alison Watt is a Vancouver Island artist whose appreciation for the natural world finds expression in her watercolors. The sort of thing that I like to paint is the detail of the forest floor. I mostly do botanical paintings and I think that the, the little plants of the forest floor are sometimes forgotten when we talk about big trees but they're an important part of the old growth forest. And I remember hearing a company forester once talking about how it wasn't worthwhile to keep old growth forest. After a while, it just rots and dies anyway. And there's, there's no real useful wood anymore. And I, I thought to myself how terrible it was to forget about the other organisms that were so much part of that forest and not really economically valuable, but an important part of the ecosystem. I think that we take our wilderness for granted here because it seems like there's so much of it and so much of it is, is inaccessible, but it really is going to disappear within a very short period of time at the rate that the old growth forests of BC are being logged. play of water, land, and sky is a favorite theme of Hornby Island artist Graham Herbert. He tries to capture the particular feeling of a landscape through shapes and colors. When you come to a place like Carmana and you can actually spend some time and delve into what's here, what the place feels like, what emotions come up in you when you're sitting beside this creek and amongst these huge trees and seeing the lines and the forms and the shapes and the the power of these big trees and the spirit and emotion of all of that, it makes you more aware of every little thing that's going on and you breathe it and live it and capture it in your work. In my painting, I'm trying to create a feeling of that kind of sensitivity and that kind of a feel of how I relate to nature as part of me rather than as something out there that I go to look at. If my images can somehow portray that feeling of nature as being part of myself to people who see my images, then I think I've really achieved something.
From his early childhood in rural England and his exposure as a student to the landscapes of British Romantic painters, Gordon Smith has always been intrigued with images of nature. During his long career as an artist and university teacher, he has explored the balance between the act of painting and the landscape. For Gordon Smith, the Carmana was both an inspiration and a challenge. I've never been up in a helicopter before, and I've never, you know, looked down on a forest so close to this, where you're looking up at the trees. It's incredible. And these trees tower above you. These, what are these, um, spruce? Uh, they, 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 you know, I've seen the cedars, the wonderful cedars, but the, you know, the bark peeling up, but the, 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 these are like columns, you know, there's no, hardly any bark on them, just the moss that sort of hangs, hangs down. It's, it's very difficult to draw and to paint. <laughs> I am interested in, you know, drawing literally, fairly, fairly literally, the things I see. And really, I start with just the color. And I look at these browns, and I look at these alizarin crimsons when, when it's wet. And I look at all the variety of greens, you know, this fresh new green when the sun's on it, and these deep, dirty greens. So you use this as a starting point, and then the form more or less takes care of itself. And the act of painting takes care of it there to allow the brush marks to show. The striking abstract paintings of Audrey Capel Doré have earned her an international reputation. For her, the Carmana represents much more than just a magnificent forest. I guess as an artist, to me, this is the ultimate work of art. It's the nurturing ground for all of us. And I feel it's um, my way of trying to tune in with it. It would be the greatest loss to everybody on this face of this earth. It's something very special that we have left. And I do hope we keep it. If we lose this knowledge that's contained in here, it's like a world's laboratory, we have lost a great deal. We may have lost everything. For 20 years, Carl Chaplin has been creating distinctive airbrush images, ominous warnings of how the natural world is threatened. I think that those of us that are interested in saving the small amount of wilderness that's left on the planet are in a very defensive role, and the tactics that we've used in the past have always been nonviolent and, uh, and logical, and I think that uh, if in fact we're right that this is a threat to the very life of the planet, then the time for those soft tactics is rapidly coming to a close. Historically, artists have always painted nature. It's been our inspiration. We've called it up spiritually, but now, things have changed over the last hundred years. The wholeness of the planet, the spirit of the planet itself is threatened by what we're doing as a civilization. Artists have now found a new role for themselves as people who can go out and inspire others to get involved. We're painting pictures of this place, Carmana Valley, to help raise money and to help raise the awareness amongst the general public of what's happening here. And as such, the art that's being turned out here is a new genre that's not just landscape art, but it's art echo. It's the art of ecology, and it's the art that screams help.
Perhaps the most popular and recognizable painter in Canada is Salt Spring Island artist Robert Bateman. His realistic images of nature convey a deep commitment to environmental preservation. Visually, I actually find clear cuts fun to look at the way one would look at old bones or just a, a, a wrinkled old person or something like that. But it's, it's because they're so ugly, they're of interest to, uh, to an artist. There's a proverb, uh, an old Arab proverb. Um, Take what you want, said Allah, and pay for it. And uh, future generations are going to be paying for the way we're, we're practicing our, our forestry um, here in BC, in fact, all over the world. Uh, we have to realize that the best things in life are not free anymore. We're going to have to uh, pay for it, we're going to have to pay attention, and we're going to have to uh, plow more money back into this if we want it to be uh, the wonderful and, and uh, viable and rich resource that it could continue to be. The bit of green in the bottom is actually a bit of skunk cabbage. It wasn't in this particular uh, valley, which is uh, Carmana, is actually over there, and there's this little valley coming down, but I, I did see a bit of skunk cabbage. That was the only life I saw, which was a remnant of an old stream that is now obviously a dead, I mean, it, it won't exist anymore because uh, it'll all be dried out, all the upper areas. And I thought it was kind of appropriate, appropriate having the, the tiny bit of skunk cabbage uh, down at the bottom there. Michael Dennis left his post as a professor of neurobiology at the University of California to start a new life as a sculptor on Denman Island. He scours abandoned clearcuts for the skeletal remains of trees to use in his sculptures. There's a lot of beauty in the material as I find it out here, even though it's been worked over by the logging company as laying seemingly dead. The wood has a lot of life in it. The shapes and the colors, the curves and the simplicity of it are uh, moving to me as I'm walking along through the slash here, looking for what I want to sculpt with. What I try to do is to retain some sense of the tree, that is to leave some of the, of the tree-ness with the wood, as well as creating the figure, the human figure, from putting together those pieces. Carmana Creek winds its way through the rainforest to its mouth on the Pacific coast. Here at Carmana Point, native artist Roy Henry Vickers found inspiration for his Carmana picture. He believes that to change our attitude to the forest, we should learn from the past. Somehow we have to raise the consciousness of the world, but especially of Canadians, because it's, it's our forest the damage is being done to us, not to anybody else. The money will be gone, the jobs will be gone, and the forest will be gone. So we're left sitting there looking at a very sorry sight. When I painted Carmana, I wanted to include 
um, images of my past. And the chief that's standing looking at you is my great-grandfather, Amos Collinson, who also was an artist, uh, a canoe carver and pole carver, standing in his Cholcat blanket with his headdress on, carved out of yew wood. There's an image of a woman sitting in a uh, cedar bark robe uh, wearing a spruce root hat to remind people that we can wear garments made from wood without killing the trees. And the lines that cross the picture indicate rain. The lighthouse is a, is a symbol of hope for the mariners who travel up and down the coast. And it's symbolic of the hope that I have for our society that we will actually see what needs to be done uh, to help preserve some of these last remaining temperate rainforests. And so our man of the lighthouse is included in the painting. By the end of the summer, four separate expeditions of artists into the Carmana had produced over 100 original works of art. Almost every imaginable artistic style and medium was represented in the unprecedented collection. For many of the artists, the Carmana project was the first time their creative talents had been directed to a highly charged political issue. In Vancouver, the collection received critical acclaim during a popular exhibition. All the art was donated to the Wilderness Committee to help raise funds for saving the Carmana. The work of 70 artists was selected for a distinctive book called Carmana, Artistic Visions of an Ancient Rainforest. The book went on to garner several awards and become a bestseller. At $2250, thank you. And the $2,500 now? At $2250, the $2,500. The original works of art were sold off at a charity auction, with the proceeds going to pay for the legal and political battles that still had to be fought over the Carmana. Twice at $2250. Third and last time, then, at $2250 on the Gordon Smith. Your sir, for $2250. <laughs> The Carmana Art Project brought the rainforest issue to public attention in a bold new way, and people responded. In 1990, the lower Carmana Valley was designated a provincial park. The fate of the upper Carmana is still undecided. When I see people in here with kids camping, and those kids will have memories that We'll never desert them all their lives long. We got enough people in institutions nowadays and so on sitting staring at the wall. I've had the occasion to go through some of these old people's homes and things like that. People who haven't anything in their mental memories to hold them and sustain them. I mean, the technological civilization is eating up everything. We need areas which are strongholds against that kind of thinking. And I think we've got it, we're sitting on it, and by God, I'm one for keeping it. 